Amen, guys. Let's get our Bibles open to Revelation chapter 1. The title of the lesson, Harvest the Earth. Harvest the Earth. Revelation chapter 1, a book often misunderstood. We're going to explain a little bit of it today, amen? Of course, we know the author is the Apostle John. And we know he wrote it while he was exiled on the island of Patmos, an island off the coast of Greece. Now, they tried to kill him. They tried to boil him in oil, but they couldn't deal with him. They couldn't kill him. They couldn't get rid of him. The only apostle to die a natural death. So here he is, exiled, and he gets the revelation from Jesus. And it says in verse 1, the revelation of Jesus Christ, which God gave him to show his servants what must soon take place. He made it known by sending his angel to his servant John who testifies to everything he saw. That is the word of God and the testimony of Jesus Christ. Blessed is the one who reads the words of this prophecy. I'm already blessed. Amen. Amen. I feel it too. And it says, blessed is the one who reads the words of this prophecy and blessed are those who hear it and take to heart what is written in it. So you're blessed if you read it and you're blessed if you hear it. Do you feel blessed this morning? It says you got to take it to heart because the time is near. It goes on and it says, John, to the seven churches in the province of Asia, grace and peace to you from him who is and who was and who is to come and from the seven spirits before his throne and from Jesus Christ, who is the faithful witness, the firstborn from the dead and the ruler of the kings of the earth. You know, it's incredible because the word revelation in the Greek is apocalypsis, which means to disclose things that would otherwise be unknown. So today we're going to be revealed. We're going to be made known the mystery of God. He's going to reveal it to us. Now, the book of Revelation was written in 95 A.D., This is under Emperor Domitian in the Roman Empire, and the persecution of the first century Christians was at its absolute worst. And it says that this revelation is written to the seven churches in the province of Asia. Well, who are these churches? Who are these people? Turn over to Acts chapter 19. How did we get seven churches in minor Asia? Now, if you look at it, uh, what what is minor Asia, as it's called in the Bible, is our modern day Turkey. It's about the western half of Turkey. It's a geographic area that equates to the size of California, amen? Now in Acts chapter 19, we find in verse eight, Paul entered the synagogue and spoke boldly there for three months, arguing persuasively about the kingdom of God. But some of them became obstinate. They refused to believe and publicly maligned the way. You know, even in the first century, the church was persecuted, amen? And if we're going to have a church that's like the church of the Bible, we're going to be persecuted also. Are you with me right there? It says, so Paul left them. He took the disciples with him and had discussions daily in the lecture hall of Tyrannus. He went to the campus and started a campus ministry, even though he was a little bit older, probably in his 40s right there. Are you with me right there? Now it says, this went on for two years so that all the Jews and Greeks who lived in the province of Asia heard the word of the Lord. Wow, this is incredible because it says in a time span of about two years, all of minor Asia was evangelized because they were persecuted and they started a campus ministry. Paul had these guys that he was training for the full-time ministry and they all went out and they preached the word every day so that everybody in the province of Asia heard the word of God. Can you imagine an area the size of California, without any cell phones, without any cars, without any internet, without even Google to answer your difficult questions about the Bible. Back in those days, you just had to read the Bible to get the questions, amen, answered. Now, now it says this area was evangelized. So we get back to Revelation chapter 1, and we see that this revelation, this, this understanding is given to the churches in Asia. Now, there's seven churches that are listed, but we know that there were many other churches in Asia, there wasn't just seven. Now, in the book of Revelation, there are a lot of numbers that are used. There's actually the study of numbers, which is called numerology. And the word seven, rather the number seven, means complete. 
It means complete. Amen? So what we have here is that there's the complete grouping of churches. So it wasn't just for all the churches in Asia back in those days. It was for God's church even today. Amen? So this revelation is not just for those people in the first century. This revelation is for you and for me. Are you guys with me right there? In verse 9... It says, I, John, your brother and companion in the suffering and kingdom and patient endurance that are ours in Jesus was on the island of Patmos because of the word of God and the testimony of Jesus. This refrain is used time and time again. It's the second time in chapter one that that refrain is used. It talks about the word of God and the testimony of about Jesus. That's what Revelation is all about. That's what Christianity is all about. The word of God and the testimony of Jesus. And he says, why am I being persecuted? Why am I being mistreated? Why was I exiled? Because of the word of God and because of my testimony. You see, you don't really believe in the word of God if you're not testifying about the word of God. Amen? That's all of us right there. We're going to testify about the word of God. In verse 10, On the Lord's day, I was in the spirit and I heard behind me a loud voice like a trumpet, which said, write on a scroll what you see and send it to the seven churches, to Ephesus, Smyrna, Pergamum, Thyatira, Sardis, Philadelphia, and Laodicea. I turned around to see the voice that was speaking to me. And when I turned, I saw seven golden lampstands, and among the lampstands was someone like a son of man, dressed in a robe, reaching down to his feet, and with a golden sash around his chest. His head and hair were white like wool, as white as snow, and his eyes were like blazing fire. His feet were like bronze glowing in a furnace, and his voice was like the sound of rushing waters. In his right hand he held seven stars, and out of his mouth came a sharp double-edged sword. His face was like the sun, shining in all its brilliance. When I saw him, I fell at his feet as though dead. You know, right here, John hears the voice of Jesus. And he hears the voice and he turns around to see to whom this voice belongs. And what did he see? He didn't see baby Jesus. He didn't see an emaciated, effeminate Jesus. He didn't even see... The crucified Jesus. He saw the resurrected King Jesus. And when he saw him, he said, I just fainted. (laughs) That's how powerful Jesus is. Are you with me right there? It goes on and it says, do not be afraid. He placed his right hand on me and said, do not be afraid. I am the first and the last. I am the living one. I was dead. And behold, I am alive forever and ever. And I hold the keys of death and Hades. You know, it's incredible right here. It talks about one as a son of man. This is, of course, an allusion to that refrain that was used in Daniel chapter 7, verse 13, to describe the ancient one, the one of old, to describe Jesus Christ himself. In the New Testament, the refrain son of man is used 195 times. Every time it's connected directly to Jesus. This idea of the Son of Man denotes two things. Number one, he's a product of humanity. He was born to a virgin, amen? He did have uh, his mother who was human, amen? But it also denotes a prophetic voice dating back to the prophecy given to Daniel. Who is the Son of Man? Jesus himself. Point number one, to harvest the earth you got to remain faithful to the end. You know, there's seven churches. And this message given by Jesus are really seven warnings given to each one of those churches. One warning per church. And you've seen articles and different sort of videos, maybe on YouTube, that talk about the seven warning signs of cancer. So one could take these passages as the seven warning signs of falling away. These scriptures are going to warn us And if we have these signs, we got to get radical and repent so that we do not fall away. Amen? You know, some people falsely believe the doctrine that once you're saved, you'll never lose your salvation. But that's a false doctrine. Are you with me right there? Once saved, always saved is a false teaching. Not only can an individual fall away, but according to Revelation, a whole church can fall away. 
And we've got to look into these warnings and make sure that we've got our doctrine on tight. Are you with me? Chapter 2, verse 1. In verse 1, it says, To the angel of the church in Ephesus, write, These are the words of him who holds the seven stars in his right hand and walks among the seven golden lampstands. I know your deeds, your hard work, and your perseverance. I know that you cannot tolerate wicked men, that you have tested those who claim to be apostles, but are not, and have found them false. You've persevered and have endured hardships for my name and have not grown weary. Yet I hold this against you. You have forsaken your first love. Remember the height from which you've fallen. Repent and do the things you did at first. If you do not repent, I will come to you and remove your lampstand from its place. But you have this in your favor. You hate the practices of the Nicolaitans, which I also hate. You know, right here, Jesus commands the church in Ephesus to remember their first love. You know, this is one of the oft misquoted verses in the Bible. We say, bro or sis, you lost your first love. And you think, oh, you're right. It's kind of like I lost my keys. Like, oh, man, maybe it wasn't my fault. But that's not what the Bible says. The Bible says you've abandoned your first love. You have forsaken your first love. You've let it hang, hanging out to dry. Now, you remember, you know, for those of us that are uh, married, amen? When you first started dating and courting your wife, amen? Or maybe you were the one being uh, courted. Uh, and and that, that, those beginning stages of love where you feel those butterflies in your stomach and everything is just perfect. And of course, you think that, that you know, your would-be spouse, your, your, your potential future spouse is just absolutely perfect. Yeah. That they always dress nicely. Uh, they always smell good. And they'll always care about you in just the perfect way. And you know, isn't it that you sort of go over the top when you're starting the date? You know, I'll never forget asking uh, what became my wife, my, my wife, Rachel. I remember for, never forget asking her to be my girlfriend, amen? I mean, I was so nervous. I, I bought her her favorite Starbucks drink. I bought her a little gift and I wrote a little card. We were in Central Park and I said, hey, uh, will you be my girlfriend, amen? And she said, yes, amen? If you didn't believe that God produces miracles, I'm your proof. Amen? And then we went ice skating, and uh, Lance and Connie's son, Mike Underhill, was on that date right there. Amen? And uh, we went ice skating, and it was the first time I had ever held uh, what became my wife. It was the first time I ever held her hand. Amen? It was just awesome. We were there we were, skating, and my hand was getting a little sweaty. I was like, I don't know if I should let go or not, but I'm just so fired up. I don't want to let go. And we started dating, and we dated for a year, and we never kissed. Our first kiss was on our wedding day, March 30th, 2012. We had a totally pure dating relationship. Now, you show me where that happens. It, ain't, it doesn't happen. It doesn't happen. Except in the kingdom of God, that's the standard. That, that's not the exception. That's the rule. Are you with me right there? Uh, I'm so proud of Chris and Mary. You know, they have such an incredible dating relationship, and now they're engaged. Amen? Now, we got engaged, and I still didn't kiss her. We held hands. Yes, we did. Amen? And I gave her what we practice in, in our church. We call it the side hug. Amen? Uh, now, the brothers, they, they, they hug each other, and it's awesome. And the sisters, they hug each other. But when a brother hugs a sister, they go in for the side hug right there. Boom. They lock it in. And all the sisters feel really loved by that right there. We're serious about our purity in God's church. Amen? And, and there, there was so much love, you know, uh, we, we actually, while we were dating, we, we broke up for a time uh, because I had, got, there was some idolatry in my heart. After about a year, I had, I started to protect the relationship. I was more concerned about sort of the status that came with dating Rachel in my mind than I, I, I cared more about that than dating, than Rachel herself. Are you with me? It's like, I, I care more about dating Rachel than I care about Rachel. That's how you know you got an idol. Uh, you know, to become a disciple, the Bible says you got to give up everything. And if there's something you don't want to give up, that's your idol. That's your God. That's the thing you're trying to protect. Amen? Yeah. Whatever that is, if it's a relationship, if it's your job, if it's an education, it doesn't matter. Yeah. God says you got to give up everything to become a disciple. Amen? Yeah. Now, God doesn't want your, your nice bag or your car or whatever. God wants your heart. And if you're holding back your heart, God says you got to give it up. you got to give God your heart. And, and we broke up. Now, when we broke up, Rachel was really hurt. 
And all the beautiful little cards I wrote her, she tore up and threw away. Can you imagine that? You thought she was sinless, but she's not. She threw away the cards I wrote her. Uh, but, but, but you remember those times and those flutters and those butterflies. And, and I wrote her some more cards. I mean, I've written her a lot of cards. Amen? Uh, and it was all my fault. So, uh, and at, at, at home, I have in a frame the vows that I wrote to my wife. And I have them hanging on the wall. It was just, it was our first love. It was so special. And Jesus says, you've abandoned your first love with him. Yeah. Do you remember what it, what it was that brought you into the kingdom? You've got to repent and do the things you did at first. You need your first love to remain faithful to the end, not just commitment. Commitment is not enough. Amen? You need to be in love with God to remain faithful to the end. Are you excited about your relationship with God? Do you have butterflies? I mean, I mean are, you, are you writing cards to God? Are you praying to God? Are you thinking about God? Are you singing songs and you're just thinking about God? Now, when Rachel broke up with me, I sang Jason Mraz. You know that song? I want, or what is it? How does it go? Uh, uh, I'm yours. And I would sing that song every night, you know? But then we sang a different song because our first dance was to a different Jason Mraz song. And it's like, I won't give up on us. And it was like, wow, our love was sort of captured by a song. Amen? And that's why we sing songs to God in, in his church. Because we're in love with God. And when we sing, we think about God. And you've got to get in love with God this morning. Amen? If you don't love God, he's not the problem. You're the problem. Amen? God is perfect. He always smells good. And you've got to get close. You've got to get excited about your relationship with God. Look at what it says. In verse 8, to the church in Smyrna, these are the words of him who is the first and the last, who died and came to life again. I know your afflictions and your poverty, yet you are rich. I know the slander of those who say they are Jews and are not, but are a synagogue of Satan. Do not be afraid of what you are about to suffer. I tell you, the devil will put some of you in prison to test you, and you will suffer persecution for 10 days. Be faithful, even to the point of death, and I will give you the crown of life. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. He who overcomes will not be hurt at all by the second death. You know, the whole message of Revelation is defined in that one line, he who overcomes. He says, do not be afraid, even of death. Do not be afraid of persecution, even of being put in jail. Satan's doing that to test you, to try you and to tempt you to make you trip. What's the message? That if you remain faithful till the end, it'll be more than worth it. Amen. Heaven is more than worth it. This is ironic because in the church in Smyrna in the year 155 AD, Polycarp was the leader of the church there. And he was arrested and taken before the Roman proconsul. And he was an old man, 85 years old, and the proconsul had mercy on this old man. And he says, listen, just curse Christ and I'll release you. And Polycarp is quoted as saying, 86 years I have served Christ. He has never done me wrong. How can I betray him now? Amen. And he was burned to death at the stake. Wow. He remained faithful to the end. Was it worth it for Polycarp? Yes. Yep. Was it worth it for John? Yep. Was it worth it for Jesus? Yep. Is it worth it for us yep. to remain faithful to the end? Yep. You know you got to have a character of courage to make it to the end. That's right. How do you get courage? Well, first got to be afraid. Amen? Yeah. Say amen if you've got some fear in your life. Yeah. You ever been afraid to talk to a stranger about coming to Jesus? Yeah. Coming to church? Yeah. Well, you need to have courage in your character. You need to have a courageous character and overcome your cowardice. Nobody's born with it. You develop it. And you develop it by practicing. You know, we've been sharing our faith a lot all week long. And I remember I went to campus, I went to USF on Monday, and I was sharing my faith, and I was talking to as many people as I could to get them on out to church, to, to get into Bible studies and everything like that. And I was a little nervous, amen? And it, it feels bad when a 20-year-old something, you know, makes you nervous, but that's just the truth. That's where I'm at in my life, amen? And I, I was nervous, and I, I wanted to pull back. I didn't want to say anything. I just wanted to, like, hide. You ever been there? Yeah. You ever seen that meme where Homer Simpson's disappearing into the bush? That's what I wanted to do on campus. I was just like, I'm just going to disappear right here. 
I was like, no, I got to push through. I need to be courageous. And I was talking to a guy, and I, I was like, I, people just keep brushing me off. They keep ignoring me. I got to figure out a way to talk to these people. And uh, what I started to do, I said, hey, can I bother you for a second? So then they, they were like, uh, they would stop. And they're like, oh, sure, like, what's up? And then I'll say, hey, I want to invite you to church, and et cetera, et cetera. So I was getting my words a little bit jumbled, and I came to one guy, and I don't know, for some reason, my hand was doing this. It's like, I don't know what's going on. I'm having, like, some kind of triggered response to fear. And I, instead of saying, hey, can I bother you for a second, I said, can I borrow you for a second? I was like, hey, can I borrow you for a second? And the guy was like, what is going on? I was like, I mean, I, but, but you know, after that, I, I got a little more courageous. I'm like, what, Jared, what are you doing? You're what kind of chicken, are you, man? Come on, pony up, share your faith. Invite these people to church. Then you start thinking, nobody's open. I even had a brother this morning tell me, you know, I don't think Tampa's open. I think Tampa's a hard place to share your faith. Oh, you. Amen. And we've all had those thoughts, amen. They went about a chicken, stop being a chicken, and start to share your faith. You got to get courage to remain faithful to the end. Are you a coward? Have you been sharing your faith? Do you have people coming out to church regularly? Have you been fruitful? This is important if you're going to remain faithful. Verse 12, to the angel of the church in Pergamum write, these are the words of him who has the sharp double-edged sword. I know where you live, where Satan has his throne, yet you remain true to my name. You did not renounce your faith in me, even in the days of Antipas, my faithful witness, who was put to death in your city, where Satan lives. You know, per Pergamum, rather Pergamum, their, their big challenge is denoted here in verse 14. Nevertheless, I have a few things against you. You have people there who hold to the teaching of Balaam, who taught Balak to entice the Israelites to sin by eating food sacrificed to idols and by committing sexual immorality. False doctrine was the big enticement for Pergamum. They wanted to believe what everybody else believed about God. And it's really interesting because in Perg Pergamum, there was a hill about 1,000 feet high, and the city was sort of built around that hill. And at the top of the hill was an altar built, a huge altar built to Zeus, the Greek god. And it says, this is why Jesus says, I know where you live, where Satan has his throne. Wow. And, of course, Pergamum is no more evil than Tampa. Yeah. No more evil than Miami. Yeah. No more evil than Los Angeles. It's everywhere now. The whole world is where Satan has his throne. Are you with me? And he wants people to believe in false doctrines. And this was the challenge of the day for the saints at Pergamum. You know, there's a few false doctrines that sort of reign supreme uh, in, in modern times. Number one, infant baptism. Yeah. That an infant, a baby could be baptized and therefore remain saved uh, for the rest of their lives, even though a baby had zero consciousness of what was happening and what is required for, for salvation. Point number one, you need faith. Amen? Well, faith comes from hearing the word of God. Of course, a baby without any consciousness doesn't have faith and doesn't need to be baptized because it's a baby and, and, and they're innocent. Amen? We know God's not going to send a little baby, a little kid to hell. Are you with me right there, guys? That just goes in contrary to what the word of God teaches. Amen? Uh, we baptize adults. Amen? A lot of young adults, but adults nonetheless. You've got to make a conscious decision to give your life to Jesus and become a disciple and be baptized for the forgiveness of your sins. Another major false doctrine that sort of reigns today is the idea of the sinner's prayer, praying Jesus into your heart as a means for salvation. That's a false teaching. To be saved, one must have faith, repent, and be baptized for the forgiveness of their sins. Now, a part of that repentance is being made into a disciple. Uh, Jesus says when he gives us the Great Commission, you got to go make disciples you got to baptize them, and then you got to teach them to obey everything. Are you with me right there, guys? Yeah, yeah. Acts 2.38 says you got to repent and be baptized, every one of you, for the forgiveness of your sins and to receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. Nowhere in the Scriptures does it teach with a mere prayer that you're saved. That's a false doctrine. Amen? Yeah. Amen? Amen. Yeah. you got to have deep convictions about this. You know, another false teaching, uh, people have, uh, you know, they, they want to believe this because it's hard to stay true to the truth is that you can date and marry anybody you want. You can't. The Bible says very clearly, if you're going to date and marry somebody, they got to be a disciple. Amen? they got to belong to the Lord. Are you with me right there? Uh, how else could it happen that you could have two sinners dating, get married, and have never kissed before the wedding day? I mean, that's, some, that's out of like 1755 or something. That doesn't happen right there, guys. 
uh, this is just incredible, but it comes because of the conviction. 1 Corinthians 7, 39, you can marry anybody you want, but they got to belong to the Lord. Amen? Uh, and, and we believe in marriage in this church. Are you with me right there, guys? And you got to ask yourself, are you hard line on doctrine? If you're not hard line, if you're weak in these convictions, you're on the verge of falling away. You're on the verge of falling away. And all of us, it's not enough for us to believe it ourselves. We've got to be preachers of sound doctrine. You were called to be a disciple. You need to be like Jesus and you need to take a stand for the truth. Look at verse 20. In verse 20, it says, nevertheless, I have this against you. This is the church in Thyatira. You tolerate that woman Jezebel who calls herself a prophetess. By her teaching, she misleads my servants into sexual immorality and eating of food sacrificed to idols. Now, a lot of people get it wrong thinking that the sin of Thyatira was sexual immorality. Well, that was, that was a part of it. But the real issue is the tolerating of sin. That they allowed this sin to fester in God's church. You know, some of us think that we should let any old Tom, Dick, and Harry to come do whatever they want, just come through those doors and sort of ruin what God is doing. And we don't believe in that. We do not tolerate sin in our church. You with me right there, guys? Now, we've got a forever tolerance policy with the sinner, but a zero tolerance policy with sin. Are you with me? Do you let anybody just come waltz into your house and, and start eating from the cupboard and you don't even know them? Like, whoa, 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 dude, like, who are you? You know what I mean? Could you imagine, like, if I come home and there's some dude in my kid's room just laying on the bed? And what kind of reaction would you have? Like, what the heck? Who are you? And if I, if I remain faithful to the Lord, I'll call the police and not take matters into my own hand. Amen? I'm a Christian, for goodness sake. And you got to go. Uh, and this is God's heart. He says, listen, I have brought together my people, and I'm the Lion of Judah, and you don't want to hear me purr, buddy. I'm a protector. I'm going to take care of the flock. I am a shepherd, and I'm serious about it, and you must not tolerate sin. It was JFK that said the hottest places in hell are reserved for those who maintain their neutrality in a time of moral crisis. Nowhere in the scriptures was Jesus neutral. God is never neutral. It's his side, or it's the dark side. And we see this all through scriptures. You're either saved or you're lost. You're either hot or you're cold. You're a sheep or you're a goat. You're building on the rock or you're building on sand. It says today you've got to get fired up and you've got to make a decision to build your life on the rock. We got about seven people fired up to build their lives on the rock right here. We're not going to tolerate sin. Revelation chapter 3, verse 1. To the angel of the church in Sardis write, These are the words of him who holds the seven spirits of God and the seven stars. I know your deeds. You have a reputation of being alive, but you're dead. Wake up. Strengthen what remains and is about to die. For I have not found your deeds complete in the sight of my God. Remember, therefore, what you've received and heard. Obey it and repent. But if you do not wake up, I will come like a thief, and you will not know at what time I will come to you. Wow. You know, the only thing we know about Jesus' return is that we don't know when it's going to happen. As a matter of fact, we're almost promised it's going to happen at a time where you least expect it. Yeah. Jesus is going to show up, and it'll take your breath away. The Bible right here says, contrary to your reputation, which may precede you, you need to wake up. Your reputation is gained in the beginning, Amen. He says, you have a reputation of being alive. You have a presentation of being alive. You have a projection of being alive. But I'm watching what you do. And you are dead. You're asleep and you need to wake up. You know, I asked Connie if Lance woke up grumpy. And Connie said, no, I let him sleep in a little bit. Amen. <laughs> you know what happens when you wake somebody up from their slumber? You, know, I mean, oh, 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 you don't like it. I mean, I don't know about you, but I hate my alarm clock. It's just like, oh, I hate that thing. You know what I mean? It's disturbing. I feel like it's affecting my emotional health. You know what I mean? It's just, I need something more soothing. I, you know, what I expect, what I would like, you know what I would want is my wife to come and like, like sort of like caress my head. Like, it's time to wake up. You're the best man in the world. But it doesn't always happen like that, amen? Now, if, it's, if, it, if, it, if it rattles you a little bit to wake up physically, how much more spiritually? Especially when you think you're awake, but you're not. 
What's the implication? These people, they're dead, and they don't even know it. They don't even know it. You know, studying the Bible with uh, Leon, he's been going to church, even leading ministries for 30, 40 years. And yet he did the discipleship study and realized, I'm not a disciple. Not only am I not saved, I've never been saved. When we did a discipleship study, he realized he needed to become a disciple. He's like, what do I got to do? We need to study every day. I, I worked real hard to sort of like, Leon, wake up. You know what I mean? I, I did my best, you know? But at some level, you can't avoid it. People are going to be grumpy when you wake them up. You know, we did a fast last week, and our goal was to fast until we had two people committed to come on out to church, and then fast again until we had three more. And Monday morning hit. And, I, you know, I was planning on fasting from food. I just wasn't planning on just drinking water, amen? And in my sinful nature, I was like, oh, I have a cup of coffee. So I had a cup of coffee. And then my wife is like, I can tell she was a little bothered. Can I share this? Amen. Uh, <laughs> and she was just like, I was like, are you okay? Are we okay? Is this, you know what I mean? You know, you know, if you have to ask that, you know you're in trouble, you know what I mean? And she was like, just like, I mean, I thought you were going to, like, just do a water fast. I was just like, <laughs> I mean, yeah, you know, I said you can do a fast that you choose. And she was like, so what are you going to do? Just drink coffee and Coke Zero all day long? I was like, no. And I gave her a little bit of an attitude, amen? I got to confess my sin right there. Uh, here's, I want to give a secret to the wives. You, you, wives, are you ready? Yeah. Wives, are you ready? Yes. Yeah. Wives, are you ready? Yeah. Okay, here's a secret. If your husband's getting mad in his response to you, you're barking up the right tree. You're touching the exact nerve that you should be. You, you were sent to him as his help me, and you are meant to make a stink when he's being unspiritual. Have some courage. I mean, don't be afraid. He's a big softy. Oh, look, at, I mean, Anthony, Zach, Joe, Lance, Jack, Leon, Jose, what a bunch of big softies. You know, they all love, they love God and they love you more than anything else. And, and don't be afraid of them. Poke the bear, amen? Get some courage. Just tell them what you know is true. Uh, amen, Chantal, amen? I, I'm Winley, I can't see Winley. He's hiding. There he is right there. Uh, and, you know, I, and I was like, you're right. So I started to do a water fast. You know what? It was super powerful. Yeah. If my wife didn't have the courage to wake me up, I wouldn't be here. You know, I, I so appreciate and so love uh, Kyle and Samantha. Yeah. When they first moved to Tampa, you know, Samantha would like text us and call us and she wanted us to fix Kyle. And I'm like, I can't. Can't fix Kyle. He's beyond repair, amen? He's irreparable. <laughs> Only the Lord can, can fix Kyle. I can't fix Kyle. Isn't that true of all of us, amen? And I think at some point, Samantha was like, she realized I, she can't fix Kyle. I can't fix Kyle. Only Kyle can fix Kyle. Only God can fix Kyle. Amen? So she just decided, I'm going to be faithful. I'm not going to blame my husband for my situation. I'm not going to blame my situation for my situation. I'm not going to blame God anymore for my situation. And all of a sudden, Samantha just decided, I'm just going to be a great disciple. And that's exactly what she did. And she led one of the most fruitful all-women's Bible talk in history. Amen? And it started to work on Kyle. I mean, I could see it. And he was getting like, he was like, mm, all right, I guess I'll come to church, you know. Uh, and it took about another year for him to just decide, all right, maybe I ought to get with Jack. Okay. So he got with Jack. And Jack just hammered on him for four hours. That's why they call him Jack the Hammer, amen. And he just called Kyle out on everything. And Kyle, you know, he's shared about this. I feel like at liberty to share publicly, amen. Uh, he was like, hey, I, everything, he was just blaming everybody for everything in his life. But the truth is, you today, you are the sum total of every single one of your choices. Nobody is to blame for who you are today. And it was really difficult for Kyle to understand that. That's been, Kyle is super talented. Yeah. Kyle is relentless. If Kyle gets fixed on something, watch out. He's a pit bull. He's a pit bull. A spiritual pit bull, amen. He gets locked on to something, and he, he will not let go. And I think Satan didn't want Kyle being spiritual. Yeah. But because there were people enough in his life that loved him enough to say, no, I'm not, gonna, I'm not going to be controlled by you. I'm not going to be manipulated by you. And that's what won his heart over. That's what broke him. And he's become one of the most, he, out of the last six, seven months, he is an incredible man of God. Totally repentant. 
I, I rely on Kyle. I, I need Kyle in my life. And, and that comes from the people in his life just deciding, listen, I'm not going to, I know you're going to get a little bit mad right now, but I'm going to push the button. I know you're going to have a bad reaction right now. I'm not afraid of you. I love you. I love you more than I'm afraid of you. I love you more than my relationship with you. So even, this, even if this threatens the relationship with you, I'm just going to squeeze that little nerve right there. Amen? And aren't wives the best at that? Amen? They just know exactly where that last little nerve is. And they just go, like, boop. They just like poke it right there. And that's what we ought to be. We cannot tolerate sin. We need to wake people up. You've got to love their soul more than you love your relationship with them. You cannot be a conflict avoider and remain faithful to the end. You've got to be okay with conflict, guys. Amen? Look at verse 8. In Philadelphia, in chapter 3, these are the words of him who is holy and true and holds the key of David. What he opens, no one can shut, and what he shuts, no one can open. I know your deeds. See, I've placed before you an open door that no one can shut. You know, that's a good point to understand that when God has a plan for you, he's opened the door, nobody can shut it. Amen? And when he shut that door, nobody can open it. And you could be, and I've had moments, actual moments, where I was, I remember one time I was really struggling. I lived in New York City and it was about three in the morning. I lived in Brooklyn. It was like two degrees outside and I had to go on a prayer walk. I was so upset about, I was vexed just about different things that were going wrong in my life, about the doors that had been shut. And I remember I walked outside and I grabbed a hold of a chain link fence and I was just like this, I was upset at God. I was mad. I was, mad. I was angry. I have, a, I have a real relationship with God, Amen. I'm always the problem, but sometimes I get mad. Sometimes you're like, God, why did you do this? Why did you let this happen? Why didn't this happen or that happen? I was upset. I was upset. I was trying to open that door that God said, this is not the door for you, my brother, my son. I've got a plan for you. It's a good plan. It's a plan to prosper you, not to harm you, to give you a hope and a future. But this ain't it. This ain't it. And maybe it was at one point, but that's not it anymore. It's like, okay, now I've got to follow where God wants to take me. He says... And it goes on, I know that you have little strength. Now, some people think the church in Philadelphia didn't have any issues. They did. They were weak. If you're weak spiritually, you're on the verge of falling away. You need to get strong spiritually. We need to strengthen one another with encouragement and with the Holy Scriptures. Amen? Amen. Verse 14, as we come in for a landing. To the angel of the church in Laodicea write, These are the words of the Amen the faithful and true witness, the ruler of God's creation. I know your deeds, that you're neither cold nor hot. I wish you were either one or the other. So because you're lukewarm, neither hot nor cold, I'm about to spit you out of my mouth. You know, lukewarmness nauseates Jesus. I mean, he just says, the Greek says, actually, he says, I want to vomit. That's what the Greek says right there. These are the very words of Christ. He says, the, the attitude, the neutrality, the lukewarmness, the tepidness, it, it just is gross. You know, there's a few things we like either really hot or really cold, amen? Yeah. I'm a big coffee guy, amen? Yeah. Uh, in the morning, I look forward to a nice piping hot cup of black coffee, amen? Yeah. I mean, I look forward to it. It's, it's encouraging, it's nice. I read my Bible, I pray, and I sip my brew, amen? Yeah. And you want it hot. Now, sometimes you want it iced. Iced coffee is really nice when it's warm outside. How about tea? How about tea? Let's go with tea. Yeah. Want hot tea or iced tea, amen? Well, well, I don't know about you, but once that cup of hot coffee or that cup of hot tea has been sitting a little bit too long because you got caught up reading the scriptures, you forgot to sip, amen? And then you take a sip, especially if there's milk and sugar in it, which I don't do, I don't do that. And you take a sip and it's like, oh, this is gross. It's it's disgusting. Milk ever, uh, uh, you know, get left out? And you didn't know it had been out for a while. It gets put back in, and then you come, and all you want is some ice cold milk, and it's, oh, oh it's, just, it's just gross. It's disgusting. What are you doing? You don't swallow it. See, you're mad at the milk, you know what I mean? It's nothing like ice cold milk, especially late at night, straight out of the carton. Amen. It's always just a little bit better. Amen. Can I get an amen from the husbands? No, okay. You want it hot or you want it cold? You know, back in the days, the showers, they used to have two dials. You remember those? The cold dial and the hot dial. Amen? And you're sort of messing with both of them, a little bit of cold, a little bit of hot. 
And you're like, oh, it's a little too hot. I'm going to turn up the cold. Oh, it's a little bit too cold. I'm going to turn up the hot. And where do you want it? Right in the middle. Right where you can just sort of just stand there and just zone out, isn't it? You just like maybe sing a little bit, amen? And there you are. You're just like, oh, man. You ever lose cold water? Toilet ever get flushed in the other room? Water tank empties out, and all of a sudden, toilet flushes. Psh, da! I mean, it wakes you up. You move. You hate it. It's terrible. You want it perfect so that you can zone out. So you can just, uh, just relax. You know, Jesus says, you're not cold. You're not hot. You're lukewarm. What's the problem with being lukewarm? It goes on in verse 17. He says, you say I'm rich. I've acquired wealth and do not need a thing. But you do not realize that you're wretched, pitiful, poor, blind, and naked. I counsel you to buy from me gold refined in the fire so you can become rich. White clothes to wear so you can become pure. Cover your shameful nakedness. Salve to put on your eyes so you can see. Those whom I love, I rebuke and discipline. So be earnest and repent. Here I am. I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come in and eat with him and he with me. You know, if a Christian is lukewarm, if a church is lukewarm, what does the Bible teach? The Spirit of God is not there. The actual image is that the church is gathered and Christ is on the outside knocking on the door. The church is assembled. Jesus wasn't invited. And maybe that's how you came to church this morning. Jesus was not accompanying you. It says, when you're close to God, when you've got the Holy Spirit, you are on fire for Jesus. Amen? Oh, come on now. I said, hold on now. Hold on. You don't want to hear me preach. I didn't, listen, I didn't come here to make you feel good. I came here to make you feel God. Amen? I said, let me tell you what I said. I said, when you've got the Holy Spirit, you are fired up about Jesus. I mean, you're close to it. You, you, you feel it. You're excited. And it's not about a personality. Could you imagine seeing Jesus exalted in heaven and give him an, a, a golf clap? <laughs> Great performance, Holy Spirit. No, I mean, the angels, they're worshiping God for eternity. Wow. And when you see God, the Bible says you'll stand and marvel. Yeah. You won't even be able to applaud. You'll just be like, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty. Whoa. See the cherubim right there? Whoa. I mean, you get enthusiastic about it. And it says the choir of holy angels, they just start to sing. And they sing in perfect unison, perfect harmony. They hit every note. The soprano angels, the alto angels, the tenor angels, and the bass angels. Even the baritones are getting into it. You see, to be fired up in God's church is not an issue of personality. It's not an issue of talent. It's not an issue of age. It's no other issue than a spiritual issue. I got to call the church this morning to get fired up for the Lord. Amen. Today, you've got to look at yourself and ask yourself, do you have any of these warning signs of falling away? Do you see in others any of these warning signs of falling away? The call is simple. Repent and call others to repent as well. I love you and to God be the glory.